So, John, what's the worst trip you've ever had? Well, that's easy, Harry. It's lugging your sorry arse around Amsterdam that one time. What was so bad about that? You were a nightmare. Was Listeners, I? he was a nightmare. Yes. What, what was I up to? Well, you know, I'm not going to tell the full story right now because it's a long one, but we suffice to say we were both in Amsterdam together mm-hmm. and we partook of a little bit of, you know, or maybe a lot of um, space cake, <laughs> shall we say. Um, and one of us took it rather better than the other one did. Well, yeah, you seemed dead bitter about it. I had a good time. You didn't seem like you were having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Quite the opposite. Well, but I'm glad you have only fond memories of that trip. Yeah. Well, yeah. This came from it. True, indeed, yes. Some films are fine, just the way they are. Other films sometimes take it way too far. But really, how? How that could it get? Let's go beyond. Beyond the box set. Welcome back, everybody, to Beyond the Box Set. The podcast where today we are pitching prequels, sequels, and spin-off ideas to The Fisher King. We'll also be pitching some drinking games and hearing from our listeners with the ideas they have posted on our social media pages. But first, we're going to talk about some of our favourite moments from the original movie and catch you up with a bit of a plot summary. I am Harry, the host with the most appropriate voice for radio. I was just going to say, you're very expressive this week. Have you been inspired? And joining me as always... It's the host who has a face for radio. Oh. It's John Lucas. Never a joke too obvious, is the Harry? No. Nah. <laughs> nah. <laughs> Great. So, The Fisher King. Yes. This was your, your pick? It was, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, do you want to know why? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> Last week, uh, you subjected us to absolutely anything, which was a, a very sad farewell to Robin Williams as a legend of Hollywood. Mm-hmm. It was his last film. And uh, not, he didn't go out on a high, sadly. Um, so I thought, I don't want to leave it there for Robin Williams for the time being. It's too mm-hmm. depressing. And also it was Robin Williams directed by a Monty Python, Terry yes. Jones. So I thought, well, what better to follow that up than to do another film starring Robin Williams directed mm-hmm. by a Python, in this mm-hmm. case, Terry Gilliam, mm-hmm. that was significantly more well-received and certainly in my opinion, hopefully you, you agree, a much better movie. I do agree. Thank God. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. You know, I'm too a, sure with you. I mean, it's, it's barely a bar to, to cross. It, it is. Uh, it's a very, yeah. <laughs> It's a very slow bar to jump over, but yeah. this definitely leap over it. So yeah, yeah, and I just—it's also—it's a film I really like. It's a good film. It's been on my long list for a while, and mm-hmm. I thought, well, why not? Sure, yeah. Mm. What yeah. did you think? I wasn't the biggest fan. No, it was very slow at times. It is. I don't think it's a perfect film. I think that this film—the uh, the thing that would have fixed this film for me—is the editing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's a, a little bit all over the place. A lot of the scenes in this go on just a bit too long. Mm-hmm. Just a bit, a bit too long to keep your attention. I would say that is a Terry Gilliam thing. A lot. I don't know if Great. you've seen any other Terry Gilliam films. I don't think we've done any. Don't think so, no. uh, the Time Bandits, nope. uh, Baron Munchausen. Nope. No, I don't. I don't. I can't think of another one you would have seen. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he does. Oh, Doctor Parnassus Imaginarium. That last oh, that him? Yeah, the one. Oh the, yeah, I saw that. Did you like it? Uh, I think I remember enjoying it. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's kind of his thing. Anyway, he does kind of films that are kind of high concept and they're often a bit messy yeah and i've never seen a film of his that i thought was perfect mm. but i like that they're often full of ideas and interesting ideas and interesting characters and interesting performances so mm-hmm. i agree it's a bit long it's a bit meandering and certain scenes you know there's certain bits that haven't aged terribly well and there's some parts of it that um <laughs> we'll get to that yeah and there's some parts <laughs> of it i think that aren't as well written as others but mm. i think on the whole i enjoy I enjoy the ride, even though it's definitely a, a roller coaster. Mm-hmm. But on the whole, I do. There's a lot more that I like about this film than I don't like about this film. Yeah, yeah. I think it was IMDb or something pitched this to me as like a, a comedy drama. Mm-hmm. That I didn't find anything funny in this. Really, I, I saw some attempts at jokes, but I didn't. I didn't really yeah. laugh at any point. I would disagree. I found certain parts that, not like you laugh out loud, slap your five. I definitely laughed. Actually, I did laugh out loud a couple of times. It's not mm. like howling, but mm. I thought, uh, well, so. Another thing about this film is that it, you know, obviously absolutely anything, nobody watched it and it certainly didn't win any awards. Um, but this this actually was nominated for several Oscars. Okay. Robin Williams was nominated for Best Actor in this film. Sure, that makes sense. And uh, Mercedes Rule actually won Best Supporting Actress in oh, this right. film. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I think she's... Who is she, by the way? Well, I was going to... Uh, well... <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was surprised I, I, I didn't think you'd let that pass uh, well there are two major female characters in this movie yeah. one of them won an Oscar who do you out of interest who who would you suggest should have won an Oscar of those two women if either of them uh, the one that was Jeff Bridges partner correct she's the one yeah, yeah. yes 
that's Mercedes. One of my favorite Oscar wins, I think, because I think she mm-hmm. is just brilliant in this film. And I mm. found her very funny. She, yeah. her, her line readings were re- actually really made me laugh. You, you, you know what? She did have some moments yeah. that, that, that I did find funny, particularly eating dinner by herself. Eating dinner by herself, yeah. berating his, the empty chair. Yeah. <laughs> I think the biggest laugh I had at the very end, actually, not to skip ahead, but when they, when Jeff Bridges comes back at the end and mm-hmm. like reunites with her and she says, if you come back for your stuff, it's not here anymore. It all got burned. Yeah. Accidentally. <laughs> her, her delivery of, accidentally. Yeah. It was just perfect. Like she is, <laughs> It's, a, it's such a great performance. I love it. I, yeah. I really think she is a shining star in this movie. I mean, yeah. all the performances are great, but yeah. I think she's very funny. And she's probably the most comedic. Well, I mean, Robin Williams is doing, I mean. He's, he, he's a comedian at heart, but yeah. his character His is, character is terribly sad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's not a lot of, there's not a lot of levity with his character. There is some. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. It's always tinged with sadness, where she's definitely... I mean, her character has a, you know, there's elements of her character that are quite like sad and sympathetic as well, but ultimately she's probably a bit of the light relief in the film, really. Mm-hmm. She's definitely got the funniest lines. So, yeah. Yeah. And I found this to be funny, but also, yeah, mostly sad, mm-hmm. but not like depressing, just like powerful. Again, again, it had its moments. It had its moments that were depressing, but on the whole, I think it's an uplifting story. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it did well. Not sure I agree. Okay. Well. What do you expect me to do? Employ? What? What? What'd you come here for? Did you come to get the rest of your stuff? There's no more stuff, Jack. It all got burned. Accidentally. Anything else before we get to the plot summary? Nah, let's get into it. Okay, cool. Let's break it down. So, The Fisher King came out early 90s, I think 1992. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, sounds about right. So, yes, stars Jeff Bridges Mm -hmm. as... Stars Jeff Bridges as... He looks weird in this. In what sense? Young? <laughs> well, well, there's, there's young. There's like, I don't know, the shape of his face doesn't look like how it does in any other movie. I love his face in this movie. I really noticed his facial expressions in this movie a lot. He was yeah. doing great work. Like, he normally He's normally a bit rounder. Mm. Not just in the body. I mean in the face. Yeah, um, I don't know if he was a little bit slimmer than you used to seeing him. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also the t- that, I think the ponytail. That hair. The ponytail definitely <laughs> did, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It was quite the look. It really was, yeah. yeah. Um no, he's definitely like playing a like eighties hangover, like douchebaggy kind mm. of character. Yeah. I think then and the, the ponytail and the kind of constant expression of like disdain was definitely mm-hmm. a part of that. So yeah. yeah. I think you're also used to liking Jeff Bridges. He's such a likable guy. Yeah. And I think he's Well I don't know, he is he isn't he isn't. I'm trying to think of the Jeff Bridges films that I've seen. Lebowski? You've got to like him in Lebowski. He's so charming in that film. Well if you remember, I didn't like him because he was lazy. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, so such a weird criticism coming from you. I like, know. I know. Like, is it one of those things where you look too hard into the mirror and you don't like what you see, kind of thing? Uh, like, maybe I don't know. Well, I find him likable, and sure. I think having someone like him is really important in this character because the character is on paper a complete arsehole, mm-hmm. almost from start to finish, not yes. just at the beginning. And it needs an actor who has his charisma for it mm-hmm. to be in any way a journey you want to follow him on. Sure, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. And I think he does a fantastic job. Yeah, I actually think he should have been nominated for an Oscar, maybe instead of Robin Williams. I think they're both great, but mm-hmm. I, I I think his performance is a little bit more layered, maybe. I guess, but I mean, who else was nominated that year? Because uh, um, he, yeah, he, he, he would have to be going for the lead, whereas yeah, no, Robin, Robin, Williams was, was, no, Robin Williams was nominated as the lead, which I thought he? was straight. Yeah, which oh, yeah. I thought was straight. Like, obviously Mercedes Rule won for supporting. Yeah. But no, he was Robin Williams was in for lead, which I found a bit odd because he's definitely not the lead. But yeah, mm. I, guess he's, I guess he's in it a lot. So. Yeah. And he was and, such a big star. And when it comes to nominations, they always just go for what they think they can get. Sure, yeah. Maybe it was more likely that year that he was going to get nominated for lead than supporting. Yeah, it's usually the other way around, but yeah. I don't know. He didn't win either way, but no. uh, yeah. He had to wait for Goodwill Hunting. Yeah. I, th- I did think it's interesting... Like I think a lot of the times when Robin Williams gets Oscar nom- or got Oscar nominations or got a lot of praise, yeah, especially in the later part of his career, it was when he was very consciously not doing Robin Williams. Mm-hmm. Like you know, in Goodwill mm, Hunting, yeah. he's very like down and. I think yeah, it's just very much like oh, this guy's got range. He can yeah. do like loud comedy, and yeah. also he can do a serious, a, yeah. a serious role. Yeah, and I think because he became so famous for doing like the big like genie mm. or Good Morning Vietnam, like yeah. the, the big, the really big like where he's ad libbing all over the place and going crazy. Yeah, I think in the later part of his career, he he worked really hard to like prove that he could do other things, and that was mm. I think he got quite. And that's what he got all his like acclaim for. But this actually, this is just Robin Williams like unleashed. Mm-hmm. This is like Robin Williams. He comes in at it's, eleven. He it's stays both. there. 
It is, but he does have very dramatic moments, but the yeah. character is very much a Robin Williams Definitely, yeah. character. You know, it's yeah. so big. It's a very big performance. Yeah. 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 I think he's very good. I don't, I don't think he's like bad in the film, but I just think it's a very typical Robin Williams performance. It got a bit tiring at points. Mm, yeah. Like I, I found it in, um, well, when you first get introduced to the character, mm. He had seen with like a bow and arrow or something, and he's just like singing away some punks. Yeah, and then he takes Jeff Bridges back to his lair, mm-hmm. and and it's just a lot. There's like there's a lot happening. There's a lot going on, and it goes on for longer than it should, and it just it it turned me off. Yeah, no, like, I, I I do struggle with this as well with him in general. Is not to speak ill of the dead, but like I, I think he's fantastic, and I really like him as an actor. But when he is doing this kind of performance, because mm-hmm. it's just. It, he just never shuts up. Yeah. And he just I, like, I, I know it, just take it down. I know it must be a, like a massive task because yeah. I, I've i heard horror stories of what he's like and how much footage he records. Yeah. But he just needs editing. Yeah. And I think Terry Gilliam was one of the, I've seen interviews where, uh, with Jeff Bridges actually and other yeah. people who were in this film who say like, normally when Robin Williams was making like a serious film, the director would be like, T- pull him down pull him mm-hmm. back. whereas Terry Gilliam was just like yeah let him go so. let, let him go like <laughs> abs- absolutely fine but just mm. make sure it's edited afterwards I was listening to the Do Go On episode on Robin, Robin Williams oh yeah and I, for- I forget the exact number but for Aladdin I think he recorded something like 30 hours oh yeah that's you, you can't, insane yeah. but then what what came out of it was, was perfect. It was perfect. Yeah. You know, well, it was a tiny sliver of what he did. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And like mm. he's he's a lot in that movie, and he and when he's there, you know he's there. Yeah. And that's fine, and it works really really well because it was edited flawlessly. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's that's. Yeah, I agree. That's, that's, that's the gold standard of how to edit Robin Williams. Yeah, when he's doing this yeah. kind of performance, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so back to Jeff Bridges though. Yeah. So he he's the opposite of that. He's like a mm. very you know, laid back actor. And, and this is, he certainly is that. So he plays Jack Lucas, who is a late night radio kind of shock jock mm-hmm. character, which is, I feel like it's a very American thing, this concept of the shock jock. I don't know if we really have it here as much, mm. but it's like late night radio personalities who have these like phone in shows. Yeah. Or I don't know if it's still even a thing, but in the nineties, I think they were pretty big. Like Howard Stern is the most famous one in real life. Mm-hmm. And it just would say horrendously offensive things and just like get loads of ratings and you know mm. people would call in and get abused by him. And he's that basically. Yeah. So he's got this late night show and he seems to get a lot of calls and from people who he just insults and that's mm-hmm. obviously his whole shtick mm-hmm. and one of the people you see him in his studio and he's kind of on he's a star on the rise he's like he's getting good ratings and he's his agents pushing him towards a potential sitcom role trying to move him into television mm-hmm. like the next stage of his career it's all everything's coming up his way yeah but then one night on his radio show he gets a call from a regular caller who is this seems to be this very lonely man mm. uh, who struggles with women mm-hmm. like kind of it seems like a very much like an incel type and Jeff Bridges gives this whole speech to him about how, you know, beautiful, um, attractive people in the world are. They're scum and they're not like us and they don't deserve to live and you shouldn't waste your time mm-hmm. trying to be friends with them because they wouldn't, wouldn't spit on your view on fire and yeah. they should all be wiped out. Yeah. He just gives this very, like, hateful invective about all these people. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of his shtick. He doesn't really mean anything by it. It's just his mm-hmm. stuff. But then he, so he says that to this caller and then the next day he's in his flat in his apartment and he turns on the news and he discovers that that same listener has walked into a high-end restaurant mm-hmm. and shot up a bunch of people and killed eight people mm-hmm. and then himself. Yeah. So it, that's a very dark opening to the film. Yeah. Right? Was it me or did that call that caller sound a lot like Robin Williams? Well, obviously it wasn't. Me and we Louise found... had to rewind just to yeah. check because like, she was adamant that it was. And so then mm-hmm. we were just watching this whole film just like, okay, how does this play out? Well, that would make the, the plot very... like that would Extremely make, different. Extremely different, yes. And so... Yeah, I was just kind of watching this film, just waiting for that twist to happen. Mm-hmm. But when, it said right straight away that the guy shot himself in the head. So yeah, I know that's what unless you think me, but, like he's hallucinating but like, Robin Williams. But like so. when you rewind and put that clip in, mm-hmm. it's it sounds exactly like Robin Williams. And so John, please put this clip in now in the podcast. Okay, sure. In well, post. I didn't really listen to it that carefully, so I will, I, don't, I don't know whether I agree or not. But I'll I'll put it in. And we'll see. Yeah. Uh, maybe he did the voice. I've not looked it up, but obviously it's not the character. No, no. Shoots and kills himself, and then it cuts to three years later. Obviously, this incident, as you would expect, has killed Jeff Bridges' career entirely. Mm-hmm. And now he is, he's lost his radio show. He's lost his like beautiful supermodel girlfriend in his fancy apartment. And he's now kind of living slash working, question mark, not really working, mm. in a video store, a video rental store, the most 90s of all occupations. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, with his new girlfriend, Anne, played by Mercedes Rule. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he is very unhappy. He's an alcoholic. He's 
suicidal. He's he seems to hate the whole world. He hates all the customers. He doesn't do any mm. like the first thing you see him do is give an annoying customer a hardcore. She asks for like a, a light comedy and he gives her like a hardcore porn video. Yeah. I do miss that about um, video stores. You're probably too young, <laughs> but like the fact that you'd walk into a video store and it would be like, you'd have like the Chronicles of Narnia next to like two nuns, one donkey. Like you just have, like <laughs> the, the most disgusting porn, just a yeah. few shelves down from like the kiddie movies. It was all in, yeah. it was all in one place. It was, it was a weird, weird thing. I mean, always, there's always the internet for that. It's all the, there. But yeah, but that's now you can do it in private. What I mean is like when I was a teenager, you'd go into these video stores and there would always be the dirty old man looking shifty. Like, you know, just <laughs> try not to let anyone notice what he was like taking mm-hmm. to the council. Like, you know, yeah. different time. But yeah. anyway, so he has no time for any of this. He seems to treat his girlfriend, Anne, with barely concealed contempt. Mm-hmm. And ultimately they, they have a fight one night and he staggers out onto the streets of New York, mm-hmm. drunk out of his mind, suicidal, and he attempts suicide. Well, he contemplates suicide. Yeah. He's put on like weighted boots and he wants to jump into the, the river, basically. Um, and while he's contemplating that, he gets attacked by some local street thugs. Mm-hmm. Um, and he is saved. He's brutally beaten. He's mm-hmm. brutally beaten up. But he's saved at the last minute by uh, Robin Williams, yeah. who is playing a guy called Parry, who is a homeless kind of vagrant who's clearly a bit nuts. He looks like he's playing one of the Lost Boys from Hulk. I was just going to say, there is, <laughs> I literally have written I literally have written down strong Lost Boys energy in this scene. Because like yeah. he's got all of his other homeless people as well. And they are, they are all like paraplegic, old, yeah. alcoholic Lost Boys. Like they, they, They've got a call that they shout yeah. before mm-hmm. doing anything. He shoots a bow and arrow that basically is a boxing glove that punches the guy in the balls. Yeah, right. <laughs> like it's, it's weird. I mean, this is, and this is it's like before Hook, right? It's like two, I think it's two years after, okay. but it's the same time period. It's yeah, like yeah. early nineties. So yeah, it's, it is weird. It's like, it's like all he needed to do was shout bangerang and it'd be it. Like it's literally <laughs> yeah. the same thing. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you picked up on that too. <laughs> but yes, so Robin Williams is homeless and certainly not entirely all there mentally. Mm-hmm. And he is, he thinks he's on a quest to, find the holy grail mm-hmm. he's kind of very inspired by old history stories and but he thinks the holy grail is just this trophy that he's seen in a newspaper clipping from some millionaire but he's who lives in a, a mansion nearby yeah and he feels thinks that he needs the holy grail so yes. jeff bridges character the whole bizarre subplot that i didn't get well i think it's about his quest for like because it's all about the red not the red knight and also because yeah. well I'll, I'll explain the character it turns so jeff bridges spends the, the, the night with the, in this guy's basement mm-hmm. and then he tries to leave and as he's leaving he is kind of pulled to one side by the owner of the building mm-hmm. who kind of asks what he's doing there and he, he explains that he only lets Parry stay mm-hmm. out of the goodness of his heart because of the tragedy. Yeah. And then this is when Jeff Bridges learns that Parry, the Robin Williams character, used to be like a, a, a history teacher, a professor even, like a very well-to-do member of society. Mm-hmm but he was out for dinner with his wife one night and his wife got shot in a restaurant. And it turns out that the shooting that Jeff Bridges inadvertently caused is what ruined Robin Williams' life, killed his wife and sent him insane. Mm-hmm. And also put him into a coma for several months or several years. However yes. long it was. And when he woke up, he was this new personality, this very troubled person. And I think, so I think the thing with the Holy Grail is that because he was a history professor and obviously the red knight that he keeps seeing whenever he gets upset or whenever mm-hmm. Jeff Bridges tries to confront him with reality it represents trauma. It's the, sure. tr- it's the, yeah, it's a very magical realist kind of way of yeah. expressing that yeah. he's all this trauma. That he's just, he can't face it head on. He can't process the fact that his wife died in this horrific way. Mm-hmm. And so he's just escaped into this complete fantasy land mm-hmm. and the Holy Grail, because I guess, cause he was a history teacher. It's all part of what he was interested in before. He uh, went. Yeah. 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 yeah okay. So I think it's, it's just the idea that it's all kind of tied in when and that it, it's, he's created this fantasy reality for himself because he can't cope with, yeah. the horrible trauma that he's actually been through, yeah. which is represented by the, the red knight, which mm-hmm. he sees. So obviously Jeff Bridges is horribly, feels horribly guilty about this. He doesn't know what to do. He tries to help him by like, throwing money at him, just trying to make him feel better. But Robin Williams has no interest in money at all. Mm-hmm. He's, he can't be bought off that way. Yeah. But he is madly in love with a manic pixie dream girl named Lydia, mm-hmm. played by Amanda Plummer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who he's kind of, quasi stalking yes <laughs> i mean we'll get to the the date scene later on where it all gets very strange but um yeah yeah so i mean i don't know actually is she a manic pixie dream girl am i being too mean like she's somewhat of a manic pixie dream girl but i feel like she's got a at least bit. Of, she she's just got her own mental health issues going on she's definitely a bit of an oddball yeah. yeah but i think she's yeah she's got her own issues going on i think she's i do think she's more interesting than your typical kind of manic pixie dream girl mm-hmm. i think she's 
I, I like. I know. There's parts of her character I liked, parts of her character I didn't. She mm. was a, she was a funny one in this film for me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, he's madly in love with her. They've never spoken. He just stalks her and watches her, and he's become obsessed with her daily routine. Mm-hmm. There's a lovely scene in uh, Grand Central Station, which is the probably the iconic scene from this movie. Oh uh, yeah, sure. When sure. Um, yeah, he, he's watching her every day. She walks through Grand Central Station in New mm. York. And there's a lovely scene where as he's watching her, in his mind, it transforms into like a waltz and all mm. of the commuters. And it's obviously so crowded there. Yeah. It transforms into a big crowded dance scene that she's just walking through and he's watching her. And mm. it's, it's really nice. And it's, it's mm. a beautiful scene. And it must have been a nightmare to shoot. But yeah, <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I find it difficult to, to get the full impact of that scene because just underlying all that was like, he's being very stalkerish right he now. He is, yeah. And it's just, it's, it's difficult to kind of put that in the back of your mind just to try and let this happen because yeah. what you're seeing is stalking in action. Yeah, it's the, it's this very like 90s thing where like what now looks horribly inappropriate and like weird, it was like charming. Mm. Oh, he really likes her. He follows her everywhere. Yeah. That, that's so charming. Yeah. Nowadays, not so much. But it is <laughs> if you're like school kids. Yeah, and this film is very much not a kid's movie. So no. yeah, it's... <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not trying to say like, oh, I'm not trying to give it a pass by saying simpler times. But I think, yeah, those kind of conversations weren't really happening as much there as they are mm-hmm. now about like, you know, actually, yeah, women probably don't want to be stalked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> they, they probably want to have a conversation with you, if mm-hmm. anything. Yeah. Anyway, so Jeff Bridges kind of reluctantly agrees to help him in his quest to win Lydia, I guess, or to fall in love with her to get mm-hmm. them together. And, and a lot, along the way, they kind of run into some other a colorful cast of kind of borderline insane vagrants. Mm-hmm. So you get Tom Waits in Grand Central Station, the guy in the wheelchair who does the monologue oh, yeah, about yeah. being like a, a moral traffic light. Which yeah. I, I love that speech. It's so good about how he's, he's the person that people, normal people look at and go, okay, that's what I don't want to end up as being. Mm. So and he gives this great monologue about that and it's very good. And then the, the most memorable one probably is um, the cabaret singer, yeah. Michael Jeter. Yeah. He was, <laughs> he was really quite something in this film. And he's very a, entertaining. A, a big highlight for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, who's just, the, again, this kind of, well, initially seems like this very just one dimensional, crazed, flamboyant, gay, mm-hmm. burnt out cabaret singer who's just constantly screaming and crying mm-hmm. and flailing around. And, and he's, he's kind of, he seems quite one note, but then there's a scene where they take, he, they find him, he's hurt himself in some way. I couldn't, I can't remember what exactly had happened to him, but he's lying in the park and he's injured and he's distressed. And mm-hmm. Jeff Bridges and Robin Williams take him to the hospital. Mm-hmm. And the, <laughs> it's one of my favorite scenes. That he, they're sitting in the waiting room with this. Very kind of gothic-y hospital with all the... You know. The the visuals in this film, by the way, just a quick pause. Mm. The visuals in this film were fantastic. They're so good, yeah. And when, whenever some when, whenever you saw a building, it was like, oh my God, this is right out of a Tim Burton Batman. Yeah. Well, Terry Gilliam is very good at visual. Like, because mm. he, he's, he's come from Monty Python and they would always have good, you know, in their own yeah. way, good visuals. Like, yeah, it's, there's lots of like fisheye lens stuff, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like what they did in The Favourites. Um, I thought the early scenes with Jeff Bridges were really good. When in the radio. Yeah, because it's, it's really shot like mm. he's on a, like he, it's in this kind of very hazy, disorienting, because he's yeah. probably on a lot of drugs. Like and the camera's on, always moving about. Yeah. Yeah. Because it gives you that sense of like him probably being on a lot of coke or a lot of other drugs. And, yeah. Like, you know, he's not focused he's just kind of all over the place so. yes and it, yeah it, it creates this very unsettling mood mm. and again especially when he watches the tv and you just pant his reaction when he realizes that he's been responsible mm. for all these people dying and it just gets very real very quick and mm. it's yeah i think it's a very well-made film in that way there's mm. lots of really good production touches and yeah. directing touches yeah. so yes but yeah this scene that i really like is in this kind of gothic hospital and this cabaret singer played by michael jesus he's like jeff bridges has basically taken him He's like cradling him like a baby and yeah. he's just screaming and crying and mm-hmm. like, why can't I be Catherine Hepburn or all this crazy, crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. And then Jeff Bridges just says um, something like, so did you lose your mind all at once or was it like a gradual slow process? <laughs> <laughs> and he gives this like very thoughtful answer. He's like, well, I was a cabaret singer and you know, one day I realized I would never be Judy Garth. He says something quite campy and funny. Uh, but then he also says that and watching all my friends die. Yeah. And it was and like, it's like, oh, wow. Yeah. It's really powerful. Because you thought, of course, he's gay in the like, 80s in New America. Mm-hmm. All of his friends died of AIDS. That makes mm-hmm. sense. Suddenly, so just, I think that's what I like about this film is that it's so over the top and silly in many places, but it does have like a grounding in reality. It's got mm, like a heart and yeah, soul to it. Yeah. It's got even these like throwaway characters, which in another film might just be the one dimensional, like comedic, gay mm-hmm. weirdo. In this film, he's got like a backstory and it's, mm. he's a real person in yeah. a way. So I loved all that. When you... 
Did you lose your mind all of a sudden, or was it a slow, gradual process? Well, I'm a singer by trade. Summer stock nightclub reviews, that sort of thing. And God, I absolutely lived for it. I can do gypsy. Every part. I can do it backwards. <laughs> but then one night, right in the middle of singing, funny, suddenly it hit me. What does all this mean? I mean, that plus the fact that I'd watched all my friends die. Jeff Bridges kind of gets to know all Parry's crazy friends and fellow vagrants and stuff. Mm-hmm. And he kind of hitches a plan to help him to meet with Lydia and actually get to know her by kind of tricking her into coming to the video store, into Anne's video store. Yes. Yeah. And Anne reluctantly agrees to help. And she, she has some reservations. Which, which, but... which, which again, it's not the way to uh, to woo a woman to lie to her. and admit For trickery, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of that in this film. It's a lot of romance via just pure trickery and manipulation. Yeah. <laughs> But it is worth it for the scene when the cabaret singer goes to her place of work. Yes, that's Because right. <laughs> they do this whole thing where they cold call her. They, they get her number and call her. And she's working mm-hmm. in this quite mundane office job in this mm-hmm. kind of big sprawling building. And they call her up and say, congratulations, you've been randomly selected to win a membership of this local video store. Mm-hmm. And she's kind of like, yeah, whatever. And she yeah, she doesn't buy it. No, she doesn't buy it, nor should she. But then so they send the cabaret singer in full drag Mm -hmm. with a bunch of helium balloons to kind of (laughs) invade her office and then do this whole perform art like this this was a high performance like (laughs) well i got the impression he didn't really get much opportunity to do that sort of thing no that's what he was just like finally i can put on a show yeah he was put yeah because jeff Pitcher says just just one verse and chorus that's all we need he's like i'm gonna i'm gonna yeah he's putting on a full performance it was Mm. great i loved this yeah that's one of the things I remember most from, I think I saw this film first when I was like a teenager and I've seen it a lot of times, but like yep. a long time ago. And the, this and the Grand Central Station waltz are maybe the two scenes that are the most memorable. Like mm-hmm. just, just this crazy performance. It's just the two, the two gayest bits of the movie then. Cool. Well, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was just so good. Yeah. So anyway, so he does this whole thing and Lydia does eventually come to the video store mm-hmm. and just, just destroys it. I Between mean, her and Robin Williams. I feel I feel like that video store had it coming. That is not a way to display videos. True. Like all stood up on end. That's what it was like though. What? Where you just you you breathe next to a shelf and the entire shelf of videos falls no, down. VHSs are because they had to be f- forward facing, right? Yeah, I get it. I, I, I've I've seen how these things are stored. They don't really store them like um, I'm going to show drawn visually, but like uh, at a bit of an angle. So the sat. Like they're leaning. Well, here's the thing. Okay, if you're storing them at home, a VHS. Oh, a home. A home is very different. Yeah, you, yeah. You can no, put, no, you, no. You, you I, them, I understand that. You put but them like, on the side so you know what you're looking for. But when but, you're in a but store, John, 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 you you've worked in HMV. Yes. They're not stored vertically on end where they can just fall over at any moment. No, but they used to be. Well, they used to be shit. I'm not. I'm not disagreeing. <laughs> I'm just saying that because they. It's really hard to display them because they're so chunky. You can, yeah. Like a DVD, mm-hmm. you can put like seven or eight dvds in a single thing mm-hmm. in a single rack and you can just get your fingers in there and just you know you, you could just sure scroll yeah through. yeah you can't do that with vhs no, so vhs no, no. you had to line honestly when i went my local i, I, one, I get the lining them up but just yeah. like lean them against something i agree i agree but yeah i can understand what yeah because this would happen all the time yeah somebody walks in they're we- like a perfectly normal person walks in they're wearing a backpack mm-hmm like accidentally that backpack brushes a shelf the entire shelf of videos falls down yeah there's t- like 10 15 minutes work to put that back no I, yeah no i found this scene hilarious and stressful oh definitely, somebody... i definitely got the stressful yeah yeah <laughs> and i loved so basically what's happening is lydia comes in and she's very she's one of the this is where she is quite manic pixie because she just can't stop like she has no center of gravity mm-hmm. she just constantly trips over and spins over and knocks things over and like yeah. and robin williams is the same like so when the two of them are trying to like meet cute they're just constantly like flinging things everywhere mm-hmm. and it, it's good physical comedy but the best bit for me was all the cutaways to mercedes rules facial reactions yes, just looking definitely. at her store being destroyed and yeah. just <laughs> trying so hard just to like keep it all in mm-hmm. she was magnificent like <laughs> yeah 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 she was good so she agrees to become a member of the video store and then while she's signing up, she mentions that she admires Mercedes Rule's nails. Because Mercedes mm, Rule's character yeah. is very, like, New York glamorous. She's got, like, big yeah. na- big nails and, like, deep, you know, very out breasts. And, you know, just... Well, the whole subplot is that she's 
really trying to sort of rekindle a relationship with Jeff Bridges, and he is not having it because he is going through his own stuff, and it's sure. and he, he's very selfish about it. Sure, and like, she's she's just looking for a good time. Yeah, and, oh, and, <laughs> and, and and she's really just trying to catch his attention at any moment, just like. Yeah. like Kiss, kissing him when he doesn't want it and just like yeah. putting her boobs always on display sure, her yeah. boobs are always out in they this. are always that's what i mean like she's there, very there like, is there is never a moment where she wears a top like above here like the, the bottom of her yes. chest but i also feel like that's her style as like a new york woman in the night i think that's just sure. like a i think she would always dress like that but i agree she's like desperately trying to get mm. jeff Bridges' attention but i think that's just how she is she's like a very like New York glamour. So she's got these giant like talon nails and they're all mm-hmm. always like perfectly done. So Lydia says, Oh, I love your nails. I wish I could have, do them like that, but yeah. I can't. And so they invite her up to for a nail for like a nail session. Mm-hmm. And that's how they get her like over the threshold. Yeah. So then you've got the two women bonding together in this kind of weird mm-hmm. way where they're doing the nails and having a heart to heart and like yep. talking about life and stuff. And yeah. And I, I really thought that this was gonna end up where she puts Lydia off men. <laughs> like if it was gonna be like a lesbian something. No, 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 no. Um, more than just like, because because they talk about dating. Yes. And Lydia's like, well, I've I've never I've never been dating or anything. Yeah. Like I don't really. Know. And then uh, the what is this? And and then Anne says like, oh, you have not missed anything. It's terrible. Mm. I thought she was gonna talk about all the terrible things about men. And so then there's gonna be a big whole awkward thing where Robin Williams is like all, like really happy and everything and just like ready for a great date. But then Lydia's just like, I don't want men. I don't want no. I don't want this. Yeah. And she's been talked out of it. And that's what yeah. I thought was gonna happen. Yeah. No, 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 no. Anne is a masterful social manipulator. She's yeah. so good at this, and I <laughs> loved watching her do it. Yeah. But she really gives her like this pep talk which, mm-hmm. and makes her feel good about herself. And she's like, you know what? You can be a real bitch. Yeah. <laughs> and she's like, I can't. <laughs> yeah. It's great. It's really fun. Yeah. Uh, so while they're, they're having this like girl talk moment, uh, Jeff Bridges is cleaning up Robin Williams. He's putting him mm-hmm. in like, he's stapling him into a suit. Which <laughs> well, okay. This, this, what, what was going on with this suit? Why did Jeff Bridges have this suit? This mm-hmm. suit was like a good, what, four or five sizes bigger than he is? Well, I think it's a Jeff Bridges suit and Jeff Bridges is bigger than Robin Williams is the yeah, point. No, but Jeff Bridges is not that much bigger than Robin Williams. I that, that, taller, I think he probably is quite tall. Yeah, but that suit was a clown suit. I, I agree. It was <laughs> it was exaggerated. I agree. It yeah. was that was way larger than Jeff Bridges was. And yeah, sure, he's bigger than Robin Williams. Yeah. But that suit was way bigger. Maybe he's lost a bit of weight. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just love the visual of him like stapling him yeah. into it. It's so funny. Yeah. And then nobody acknowledged I guess Lydia's not really one for fashion, but like nobody acknowledges that he's stapled into mm-hmm. his suit and it's mm-hmm. very clear that the suit is just cuffs and collar is just mm. it's all staples to keep yeah. him into it it's ridiculous yeah, yeah. great <laughs> and it looks so uncomfortable in it as well yeah, like it does. <laughs> but I, I was i was also thinking it's a very me thing to think like oh my god that white suit that's never gonna stay white is it yes well that too. <laughs> <laughs> this man's practically homeless he doesn't know how to keep things clean he's literally homeless he's not practically homeless he has a place to stay i, I guess he lives in a basement sure yeah. okay anyway so they go on this like double date yeah. And it turns out that against all of the odds, these two oddball characters actually, they've got a real connection because mm-hmm. they're both, well, they both eat like pigs. Yeah. That was, Again, the suit. Yeah, the suit. <laughs> I, I thought the food waste would, would be what really upset you. All those dumplings flying everywhere. There's that, yeah. yeah. But, oh, well, I didn't think there was much food waste going on. I didn't put it past them to be picking that stuff up off the floor. Yeah, I think they were, yeah. So, yeah. Fair enough, sure. Food waste, not an issue in this. Okay. But yeah, anyway, they, they just, they connect mm-hmm. and they, the sparks start to fly. And yeah, they have a, a, a nice evening and they connect. And so Jeff Bridges and Anne, they walk home and they, they have their own lovely little scene where they're both finding the whole thing very entertaining and they mm. have a lovely little little snog in the lobby. And it, yeah. it's lovely. It's really nice. Yeah. And then we get Robin Williams and Lydia's scene where they're walking back and mm. she gives this, well, this is where the scene that's like half nice and half weird. Yeah. So she gives this kind of heartfelt speech about how hard dating is and um mm. And then she's like, I don't know why I'm even putting myself through this. So I just, you know, let's just cut it off here before all those horrible things happen. Yeah. And then he chases her down and he tells her that, well, he tells her to shut up. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it, he, it's aggressive. He, he, he starts off great. Yeah. <laughs> he says, shut up. I've got a hard on for you the size of Florida. Yep. And then he just describes all the ways in which he's been stalking her yep. for the past year or however long it's been. Yep. And rather than run screaming into the building, she's he, like, oh my God, you must really love me. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, this this six sequence hasn't aged brilliantly. Yeah, I guess they had to get to this point, but I think they could have done it a little bit more artfully. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, 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 I, I, feel, I feel like he sold the line of like, I've got a hard on the size of Florida. I feel like he that that, that didn't come off like super. No, I, I think he throws it, could, it away in a nice cause, way because yeah. it was just a way of saying like, no, no, no. I I I do I really want, do I, want I to do want to sleep with you, with you yeah. but like 
I don't want to sleep with you like just for one night. Yeah. Which cool. I got, he starts well and then Yeah, he definitely got that message. Yeah. But then when it's like, I've been following you for years, I know I, I know how you get in through doors. Yeah. I know which trains you get in the morning. Uh, it's it's truly horrifying. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but she likes it. It's what she wants to hear. I guess. And, uh, yeah. yeah. So they have a little kiss, and then she runs indoors. I have a confession I have to make to you. You're married. No. You're divorced. No. You, you have a disease. No, please stop. I'm in love with you. Not just from tonight. I've known you for a long time. I know that you come out from work at noon every day and you fight your way out that door and then you get pushed back in and three seconds later you come back out again. And I, I walk with you to lunch and I know if it's a good day if you stop and get that romance novel at that bookstore. I know what you order and I know on Wednesdays you go to that Timson parlor and I know that you get a jawbreaker before you go back into work. And I know you hate your job and you don't have many friends and. I know sometimes you feel a little uncoordinated and you don't feel as wonderful as everybody else and feeling as alone and separate as you feel you are and I love you. So he has this moment of happiness, but then this moment of like pure happiness he has triggers okay, off. First of all, he begs for a kiss. Yes. He begs for a kiss. He does. That's never a good sign. That doesn't, no. No. But, that doesn't work for me. No. <laughs> You got experience on that, Harry? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Harry is not too proud to beg. Um, <laughs> it's never worked. No, no. Begging seldom does. But yeah, so she goes indoors and then he's got this moment of pure happiness. He's had a great date. But then unfortunately, the happiness of that date triggers his trauma. And mm-hmm. then we get the flashback to his wife being murdered. So gory. It's, 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 it's like you very intense. You literally see the two of them in flashback before he went crazy mm. having a nice meal and then the killer walks in and shoots her and you literally see her brain spatter all over his face yes yeah. really grim it's not just like a red mist it's chunky no it's chunks of flesh and brain yeah, yeah. it's and it works because it really brings home just how traumatic you, exp- you understand mm. why he's the way he is because yeah. who wouldn't you know he has a full episode a psychotic episode mm-hmm. He runs screaming through the streets of New York and he ends up getting attacked by the same thugs who he'd rescued Jeff Bridges from at the beginning of the film. Yes. And they beat him horribly, essentially into a coma. Yeah. And he's essentially in a comatose state after that. Mm-hmm. And then we cut to... Well, that's also the hallucination of the Red Knight as well. Yes, the Red Knight, but I feel like, yeah, it's a combination of the trauma and the fact that he gets horribly beaten. Yes. Yeah. But he ends up like in this comatose state, basically. Yeah. Then we cut to Jeff Bridges very abruptly being horrible and dumping Anne, yeah. who's been nothing but nice to him. Yeah, and it seemed like but, the but thing- also in the most selfish way. Yes, in the he worst like way. He, he, so we we have skipped over a few bits where Jeff Bridges shows how selfish he is. Like mm. near the start, once he's met Robin Williams and he knows who he is, there's one point where they're outside his building or something, mm. and uh, Jeff Bridges just starts giving him money. He yes. gives him all the money that he's got on him. He says, what's it going to take? I've got $70. What's it going to yeah, take? Yeah, he just wants to buy off his pain, yeah. And then Robin Williams goes and gives that money to somebody who's more in need of it, another yeah. homeless person. And then Jeff Bridges is like, what are you doing? I gave that money to you. Yeah, and he like which claws is, at other guy's hand. Yeah, yeah, which is yeah, it's, it's not not a likable character trait to watch. No, not well, not at all. But like, It's yeah. not meant to be. No, no, his whole character is supposed to be. like It's his journey yeah. to redemption. But yeah, yeah, I, I, I didn't know when to put this rant in, but like... He does not deserve Anne. No. Anne is the nicest character in this film. She comes on a little strong, sure. But like, she gives him nothing but like a she roof feels, over... She feels like the most real person in this. She really truly she does. She acts yeah. like the most real person. Yeah, she's got layers. Yeah. And also, this is another one. I know I said this about What Lies Beneath. Mm-hmm. Very different film. But yeah. I do like the fact that I think today you wouldn't have someone who was like, a, well, Jeff Bridges' age. But also, if you did, it would be someone who was like, so unrealistically pretty like like she's a gorgeous woman but mm. she looks like she's like lived a life mm-hmm. like she really feels you can tell that she's a woman who's like probably on the wrong side of 40 and well, she's I, lived I, well i think that that was important and i think that that would still be the case if yeah. they did this story today because mm. it's an important character trait that you know time is time is ticking basically yes. like her life is not at the early stage no sure yeah. and so when she's saying things like you know I've waited for years mm. um, for you. Do you think we've had a relationship for the last three years? I've just been waiting. Yeah. And so now what, you're just going to leave, mm. but you're not even dumping me. You're just saying you want some time. So I've got to wait for you to dump me as well. Mm-hmm. Like, no, I'm not having this. Yeah, no, it's which, a great which scene. Which made sense. And like that, 
just physically wouldn't have made sense if she was you know like 20 or something yeah. as you know a, a young car- a young actor to yeah. the young Jeff Bridges it in this no i agree but I, I just really liked that you had somebody who really looked like they've like had a whole life and then yeah. yeah she she just like you said she felt very real and, and the, the minute that he started breaking up with her when he said something like and i think i need to take some time or something yeah. like that i was like okay here we go <laughs> here we go i can see something's gonna happen here because yeah. you know the film is getting on at this point it's getting yeah, towards it, it, the end i'm like okay it. she's clearly about to have a character arc that comes yeah very presently mm-hmm. yeah no, it, it, it's a it's a very good. She's fantastic in this scene. It's one of the reasons I think she won the Oscar. Like she's, mm. yeah, yeah. Well, I think what is it she says? Like, if, yeah, if you're gonna hurt me, hurt me. Don't just drag it out. Yeah. yeah. So, which is it's great. Like, yeah, it's definitely her Oscar scene. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Let let me let me just ask you one thing. You love me. I don't know. You can't even give me that, can you? Jesus, Jack. What were you planning on doing here? Were you planning on just packing up your things, walking out the door and dropping me a note when you meet I somebody new? I have no new? idea what I was planning to do. I just said I need time. Bullshit! If you're gonna hurt me, hurt me now! Not some long, drawn-out hurt that takes months of my life because you don't have the balls! Okay, I'll pack my stuff tonight. Um, what have you been doing here? Could you just tell me that? What have you been doing here? Hey, we both got something out of it, okay? What did I get? What did I get? What did I get I couldn't have gotten from anybody with no name any night of the week? Do you think your company is such a treat? Your moods, your pain, your problems? Do you think this has been entertaining for me? And what do you want to stay with me for? So he dumps her horribly and then he, in the middle of breaking up with her, he gets the call mm-hmm. that t- Perry has been attacked. Yeah. And so, and she very nicely comes with him. Like after all that, she still supports him. Uh, I think that, I think you, you would, if, if, yeah. you, if you hear that, like somebody who, you know, you were just having dinner with last night. Yes. I'm like, just saying she's, she's a supportive girl. I just, she's very supportive. I, I don't think that she's just doing that to support Jeff Bridges. No, she's doing it because she's a decent person. I, think she's not, well, I don't think she's doing it for any Jeff Bridges reason. I think yeah. she's just like, Oh, the person I had dinner with last night is currently in a coma. Yeah. No, I'm just saying she's a decent person. Yeah. I just I appreciate that she was there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they go to the hospital and yeah, they find that Perry is he's, he's in a vegetative comatose state mm-hmm. again, which is what he was just after his wife's murder. Yeah. And the, the doctor's like, he could be like this for years and there's not really much he can do, but he'll just have to stay here. So then Robin Williams is left in the hospital mm-hmm. and Jeff Bridges tries to move on with his life. He gets his radio show back on. He, he, he does break up with Anne or they break up from each other. Yeah. He gets his radio show back and he starts, he's like on the cusp of starting his new career or relaunching his career, but he's still kind of racked with guilt. He can't escape his guilt over mm-hmm. Robin Williams. And then on one day he runs into the cabaret singer on the street and the cabaret singer tries to talk to him and he turns away and leaves him. But then later that day he has a crisis of conscience. Mm. And so he decides he has to help him after all. So he d- d- what he decides to do is to finally help Parry to achieve his dream of winning back the holy grail yeah and he hopes that that'll help him to come back around so he breaks into this rich old guy's mansion <laughs> this again this was bizarre it, it, it was yeah it was like clearly he had not thought this through in the slightest yeah it was, it was a very inept break in yeah like entertainingly so but like first of all he, he, he's so he's climbing up the walls mm-hmm. it's like a classic uh mission impossible style break mm-hmm. and he's doing it all from the outside yeah he climbs up the walls he's, he's climbing up the, onto the route one of the several like mm-hmm. steeples or roofs kind of things and then he just, he just pulls out an anchor. I was like, where did you get that from? Yeah. Where did you get I, an anchor? I, I don't know. And he's really prepared with a bow and arrow with a little string as well. Yeah, so he's he, fully kitted out. Like, he he seemed to have thought this through. And I didn't feel like he ever had this level of competence before. Well, he's thought. not competent, though, because he flings the he flings the anchor. Mm. Oh, no, he, fling, he, he fires the arrow on uh, tied to some rope. And then yeah. he attaches the anchor and it, it, so, so that he's got, like, a, a swing, basically, because he's going to yeah. climb a rope. He didn't look like the kind of person who had the physical strength to climb no. either. But like, yeah, there's so much of that I was like, wow, he's going to die. Like he's, yeah. he's swinging on a rope and he's, yeah. yeah. As a piece of physical comedy, it's great. But I couldn't really buy that he would actually successfully break in. Yeah, sure, sure. But he does, he breaks into this mansion. And while he's stealing the trophy that Parry sees as the Holy Grail, mm-hmm. he actually discovers 
I think, is it one of the security guards or is it the rich old man? Oh, I have no idea. The, I think it was the rich old man. The rich old man's like slumped in his chair, mm -hmm. apparently having accidentally overdosed on something. Mm -hmm. And so rather than leave him to die, he sets off the alarms as he runs off. Is that what was going on? Yes, because then he read the newspaper headline says owner of hotel, whatever it might have been, mm. you know, suicide attempt thwarted by breaking. Right, um, sure. Yeah, and it, I think the point of that is that he's redeemed himself because he caused all those deaths. Yeah. But now he's saved a life, so he's, right. you know. Right, okay. I missed the bit where the guy was ODing. Yeah, I think, well, I've, he wasn't just asleep. Clearly something was wrong, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but the point is he, he saves this guy's life and mm -hmm. that somewhat redeems him from all the people he previously almost accident. Yeah. He previously accidentally killed. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so he, he takes the grail to Parry. Mm -hmm. He puts it in his hands and then Parry not immediately, but that night he wakes up mm -hmm. and it seems that he's finally moved on from his trauma. Mm, yeah. Like he, he, he says, you know, I really miss my wife. She was beautiful. I really loved her. Mm -hmm. Can I miss her now? And it's like, it's like he's finally defeated the trauma. Like he's been able to move past the trauma and come to terms with mm -hmm. who he really was and what really happened to him. And so him and Jeff Bridges are kind of reconciled. Then Lydia comes back. It turns out that Lydia from the first date has been, it seems like he's, Robin Williams has been in a coma for a while. Seems to be, At least yeah. a few weeks. Yeah, yeah. It seems like she, despite it only being one date, has been like really tending to him. She's coming to check on him every day. And mm. so they have a lovely reunion where he's yeah. kind of singing with all the other homeless people. And then she comes in and they have a big kiss. And it's, yeah, it's nice. Yeah. Uh, and then so Jeff Bridges, he goes back to Anne and she very generously takes him back. Oh, she did not need to do she that. She did not. I was, I was like, you know what? You can do better, love. Yeah, you, you can do, even now, you can do better. You don't owe him anything. All he gives her is, he says, well, I guess I love you. Like, the, yeah. most, <laughs> the most feeble half heart. He should, yeah. although I did love when she, he gives her like the red rose. And, she and then goes, she throws she it. Flings, so she's like, did you, what, did you see his face during that? I had, yeah. to, I had to rewind and watch it again. Because he was like, I paid 50 cents for that. Yeah. It was, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, she, yeah, she really makes this scene work because, yeah, yeah like, she's like, fuck the flowers. Like, yeah. what did you say? Like, I mean, it's the shittest bouquet of flowers. It is, but I just like, she's like, got no time for that. No <laughs> yeah. time for flowers. It's yeah. like, just say it or don't say it, but get out. But yeah. Anyway, so he finally admits that he loves her. Mm -hmm. She slaps him, which he definitely deserves. Mm -hmm. But then they have a big kiss and they're just like, all the porno videos fall on top of their heads, <laughs> which would really hurt. It would, wouldn't it? <laughs> I've had videos fall on me before. Even like empty cases. They're very hurt. heavy and yeah. they, are, they have sharp edges. Yeah. You know? But yeah. yeah, they reconcile too. And then everyone lives happily ever after. And it ends with Jack and Perry lying naked in New York City Grand Central Park and yeah. just cloud busting, looking at clouds. Yeah. yeah. And there ends the movie. What a, what a weird way to end a movie. Well, it's a nice, it's a buddy comedy. It ends on a buddy comedy beat, you know. I guess, sure. Yeah. Uh, that's the yeah. Fisher King. That is the Fisher King. Okay, should we move on to drinking games? Yeah, sure. So first one I've got here is drink for a flashback. Yes, drink for flashbacks. Uh, the flashbacks to the accident, the incident, I guess. Mm, Are there any yeah, others apart from mainly. that? Um, no. Okay. Uh, I had one that was somewhat related to that, which is drink for brutal violence. <laughs> there are some very brutal scenes <laughs> in this film. Yeah. Like the shooting, obviously, when that poor woman's head explodes in Robin Williams' face, mm -hmm. but also like a lot of the, when they get beaten up, you know. There's just lots of violence. He gets Jeff Bridges gets doused in gasoline and almost set on fire early in this film. It's very harsh. And he's just he's just trying to kill himself. Yeah, but he, he, he he's wants just to minding his own business, just trying yes. to do a simple suicide, and then yeah. people come and. Yeah. But there's nothing like being set on fire that to tell you actually I don't really want to die. At least not like this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, drink for the Holy Grail. Yeah, just references whenever, to yeah, yeah, whenever it's mentioned, seen or drawn or mm. whatever. Yeah, I was gonna say drink for like medieval references because obviously that's a. A big motif in this film, like the mm -hmm. Holy Grail, mentions of the Fisher King, which a is man who lives in a castle. For a man, exactly the castle. You know, they they use a lot of like old school weaponry kind of things with mm -hmm. like bows and arrows and lances. And, yeah, and of course the Red Knight. So yeah, any medieval imagery, give yourself a drink. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, drink for any potentially Oscar nominating moments. All Oscar scenes. Sure, yeah. yeah. Any particular stand out to you? Well, there's uh, certainly a few Robin Williams ones. Mm -hmm. I'd say probably the the scene of him relapsing, getting triggered again, and yes. that, and uh, yeah, then basically Anne's scene where she dumps Jeff Bridges. I think he dumps or, her, but yeah, when she reacts, yeah, understandably poorly to being dumped. Oh, that's, yeah. the, that's the problem though, is that he doesn't dump her. Yeah, he won't dump her. He's trying yeah. to like string her along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely, deservedly. Yeah, yeah a deserved Oscar win there. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, another Anne related one: uh, uh, drink for smoking. Yeah, sure yeah it felt that that's it felt very 90s to have characters who were just constantly chain smoking and mm. it's not like a 
it's not a plot point. It's just a character thing. Yeah. There, there, there's so much smoking in this film. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You wouldn't see that today. Very true. Very true. Uh, also, drink whenever men are shit. Yeah, specifically Jeff Bridges. I well, I guess Robin, Robin, Robin Williams, he has his moments He too. is also a stalker. Oh, actually, we didn't talk about the moment when he actually full-on sexually assaults Anne. Oh, yeah. When they're getting ready. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he just, just, like, stands on the table and, like, so he, he says all this stuff about how her boobs are so gorgeous. Mm-hmm. And then he, like, he tries to pull his pants down. And, mm-hmm. and Je- Je- again, Jeff Bridges, he's such a shit boyfriend. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't, for a moment, like, he doesn't lift yeah. a finger. He doesn't react. Like, she's, like, in the corner, like, help me, help me. He's, like... He, Parry, stop it. Yeah, he's just like, he doesn't even say that. He just kind of says, oh, so this suit is in a... F-. Like, he doesn't even acknowledge that it's happening. Yeah, yeah. He is an utter yeah. shit to her. Like, yeah. there's nothing to, like, defend her in the slightest. Like, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure she could handle it. She's definitely a woman of the world, but sure. Still, like, yeah. But, like... You'd, you'd think, yeah. Yeah. Not, she can do better. Yeah, it's not what you want. Yeah. Yeah, I drink every time Jack treats Anne like shit, which is basically the same drink again, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. I'm done. I had drink for fisheye camera le- camera shots mm-hmm. and drink every time Lydia drops something, trips, or is in any way adorably clumsy. <laughs> Since that's like 90% of her character. Very true, yeah. I, d- I actually did find the the dumpling eating scenes to be quite stressful. Yeah. Just because it's like, it's just, mm-hmm. cut, just learn your lesson. <laughs> Use a knife and fork. Just, you know. We've heard Robin Williams was, was saying like, oh, she does this all the time. That's what I mean. I was like, why keep ordering it's it like, then? You clearly don't know. How are you not learning? Yeah. Like, just go and eat somewhere else. Eat with your hands. Just eat the food. Yeah, just get ask for a knife and fork. It's fine. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, listeners, if you didn't think that that was enough drinking games and you want to hear some more, then maybe what you should do is you should go to patreon.com slash beyond the box set where you, if you subscribe to us, you can have extended episodes. Mm-hmm. So we will give you more drinking games, more sequel pitches, more listen submissions, just generally more, more bang for your buck, mm-hmm. as I say. You also get a few extra things as well. You get a little advert on the on the main show if you mm. want to. You'll probably hear that John slots them in every now, every now and then. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we get have an exclusive Facebook group, and also once a month we do a Patreon episode where we get the Patreon to pick a film for us, which they can guest on if they want to, but they don't need to. Mm. Uh, yeah. So all that is available at patreoncom slash set. Mm-hmm. Let's see, Alex. Uh, what do you think of Jaws, which is at 97% Rotten Tomatoes? I find it to be anti-shark propaganda. What do you feel about the Entourage movie, which is at a meager 33%? I think they finally got Hollywood right. How about It Follows, 97%. Worse than your parents giving you the sex is evil talk. How do you feel about Juno, which is at 94%? That would be a movie that celebrates a teenage homewrecker. Uh, how about Bewitched at 25%? best television adaptation ever put to film. How do you feel about American Hustle at a towering 93%? Overwrought awards bait. Righteous Kill, 19%. The movie that Michael Mann wishes he had made when he created Heat. Sounds about right. I'm Julio. I'm Alex, and we are the Contrarians. As you can tell, our thing is that we rage against the Rotten Tomatoes machine. Regardless of what we really feel. Find us on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn. Facebook, Twitter, we're everywhere. Okay, then on sequel pitches. Yes, sure. Right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start. Mine's not got a title, but we'll 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 see if anything comes. Okay, this might be a couple of ideas. It might be one idea. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see where it goes. Okay. Well, that's typical Terry Gilliam film. It, yeah, maybe it's like a <laughs> crazy bunch of ideas. Maybe it's just gonna squeeze into one weird or unwieldy film. Yeah. We'll find out. Yeah. But I've not got a lot here, so please do jump in if you sure if you have yeah. anywhere to go with it. So sometime later. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a sequel. Okay. Um, cool. I've, uh, I've I've done some recasting. For obvious okay. reasons. Yeah. So Parry is now going to be played by Bradley Cooper. From Robin Williams to Bradley Cooper. Mm-hmm. A bit of a downgrade, but okay. Why Why? Why him? I thought visually they... They look not dissimilar. He's, he's such like a... He's so bland. He can... I've never be... seen him like go all up. Like I mean, n- nobody can do Robin Williams except Robin no, Williams. No, it, it, it's an impossible recasting to do. But I was, of all the people, like he just doesn't seem like a very high energy kind of guy. If you'd said like Ryan Reynolds, it'd be I mean, like a I downgrade, mean... but... <laughs> <laughs> huge that, downgrade but yeah, he, he at be, least yeah. can be like can riff you know? yeah sure well uh, Bradley Cooper he can do some more high energy stuff you just, oh, you're just I mean, you're probably thinking of like a star is born where he's yeah I suppose actually yeah he's, he does the raccoon doesn't he, he so, yeah, yeah like he's, okay. he's, he's he's good in things okay fine 
He's a very good actor, so I'm just assuming that he's got some sort of range. Okay, well, um, it could it could be like no, um, but he was in the Hangover trilogy. Not saying I've that not that's, seen those. Not, not saying that that's good, but just saying like, look, he's not just a star is born. Okay, fine. No, I've, to be fair, I've not seen that much of his work, so yeah, maybe, maybe this is going to be a revelatory performance for him. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, One day they probably are going to do a Robin Williams movie, aren't they? Like a biopic. Someone's going to do that. I wonder. I'm sure it'll be terrible. But they'll probably they're, they're probably just waiting for the right actor to to come start along, their career. Yeah. <laughs> Because right now, the, that actor doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Like the, the Rami Malek to Freddie Mercury just True, yeah. <laughs> doesn't exist for Robin Williams. No. And obviously, I'm not going to cast uh, Jeff Bridges in this to go against, to go with Bradley Cooper because the ages are vastly different. Sure. So I, th- I was thinking more Matthew McConaughey. Again, not, a not, downgrade? Not, 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 okay. not necessarily exactly Jeff Bridges, but I'd say Jeff Bridges in this. I could see Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Like a, yeah. Because he's a bit sc- sort of scrawly. Yeah, in this, and he's got kind of bad hair. So. Yeah, no, I, I, I can. See, I mean, I think Matthew I mean, McConaughey doesn't have the inherent likableness for me anyway that Jeff Bridges always has. But I can see what I can see the logic. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I've done my best at recasting that. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So the two of them, they do a show together. Okay. Um, I'm, I reckon it's probably going to be a TV show where they find random people off the street, normally homeless people or people who are a bit kooky, mm-hmm. um, and they match them as a dating show. Oh, okay. Because this was something of a subplot where when Jeff Bridges is trying to relaunch his career, mm. he has a meeting in a producer's office, doesn't he? And they say, yeah. we want to do a sitcom about the homeless. Mm-hmm. So maybe after he's rescued Perry, like brought him back from the brink of, you know, his yeah. coma, he kind of brings him in to kind of and, work and, together and to do like a genuine spotlight on the homeless and actually tries to help them. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, make it more of a, a reality show. Rather yeah. Than- I can see that, R- yeah. Rather than the fictional sitcom. And maybe it like starts with the best intentions, but obviously the evils of TV intrude and it ultimately becomes oh, yeah. quite exploitative. Yeah. And then that, that puts a strain on their relationship because Jack is much more concerned with like reclaiming his fame. Ratings and, and, yeah. And Robin, will, like, Parry really just wants to genuinely do a good thing and he's not interested in the fame or the money and it, it causes a rift between them. Yeah, it definitely split them apart and then yeah. somehow they get it back together. Well, yeah, I mean, well, so... To be honest, this could kind of lead into my second idea. Mm, uh, you're straight for that if you want. Yeah. So, yeah, like definitely maybe that like that Jack goes the ratings route and then Robin's like trying to go the moral route and it's not quite working. They split apart. They they, they break up their uh, their show business relationship. Sure. Maybe the show's going off the air. It's not gone off the air. Maybe like the contract is still open for something to happen. Yeah. It's not all being cancelled yet. But uh, so Parry hears that the, the mental institution that helped him multiple times in his life, is closing down. Okay, due to, like, budget cuts? But, yeah. Sure, okay. And are they going to put on a show? So? And so all the patients are going to be kicked out on the street. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking that I could basically take this the sister act route. Right. And so get Parry to, to come in and just conduct a choir. Yes, because he's clearly doing that. In the yeah, he's, he's already done that in that institution. So... I think that'd be good. Like, every, like a, yeah, like a feel-good comedy about... A, that shines a light on mental health. Mm. So you could have like people with all kinds of different conditions, a lot of them being like homeless and like, how do they, it could be like almost an orange is the new black where you like, you go, you, you start with Robin Williams, the star, and then mm-hmm. you like branch out with all of these characters mm, yeah, and yeah. you go back into the, like, how did this person become homeless? Like what's their story? Yeah. And you know, and you find, and it humanizes them and it, you understand that people, but also they're people, but also they've got like, they've all got talents and mm-hmm. they all perform. I mean, that could be good. Yeah. Yeah. It could be like a comedy word message. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say that's that's that's, that's pretty good. Mm, excellent. I don't have a title for it though. Okay. Um, Fisher King Two, back in the straight jacket. Oh yes, is that is. yeah? That's, is that's that fantastic. in poor taste or no? I think it's good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it's in poor taste. Yeah, but, 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 but it, it, it's tricking you. Yeah, back it's in, in the por- straight jacket. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it's a, it's a it's a cheesy title that actually. Pull it back and there's some depth there. And yeah. we're actually, we're, we're not, yeah, we're, we're not characterizing all people with mental health problems as needing straight jackets, but it's like, yeah, it's playing with the cliche. So, okay, yeah, that's my excuse. I'm sticking to it. Yeah. Back in the straight jacket. Back in the straight jacket. It's good because it sounds like it rhymes. Yeah, it doesn't quite, but it's no. close enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. Okay. No, I think both of those are good ideas. And I think, yeah, if you combine the two of them, and maybe him and Jack reconcile at the end, I think. Certainly, yeah. Maybe Jack apologizes. Okay, I know. Okay. Well, I was going to say that maybe like putting on this show is then the show that him and Jack do together. Well, that's what I was going to say. So, Parry leaves, sets up his, you know, not-for-profit mental health choir. Mm. 
Meanwhile, Jack tries to keep pushing the tacky reality show, yeah. but it bombs in the ratings. And without Parry's help, it just becomes this, it's phony, it's fake, there's nothing real about it. Mm. And it just gets worse and worse and worse. And he ends up walking away from it and it, it gets cancelled and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And then he rediscovers what Parry's doing. And it, and it turns out that what Parry's doing is much more televisual because he's genuinely helping people and it's mm-hmm. interesting. And between the two of them, they put on like a telethon. Like they put all, yeah. all the homeless oh, yeah, people yeah. performing for a massive like fundraiser for the local hospital. And it saves the hospital. Mm. They do a fundraiser. Yeah, it's a classic fundraiser to save the, the rec center, but in yeah, this case it's yeah, the yeah. hospital. So yeah. but all, all the homeless people, all the, all the people who have struggled, they all get to, and you can have Tom Waits back because Tom Waits is a, 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 oh, of course. a well-known of course, yeah. singer. Yeah. Yeah. So he comes in and does a bit of gravelly singing. Yeah. It's just, it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Anything that ends with a big old sing along to save a hospital. Yeah. <laughs> so, Fisher King 2, back in the straight jacket. I think that's, I mean, that's a winner. I know you had a bit of a hard time with that, but I think that you, you come up with a winner in the end. So. Great. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Cool. Okay. So was that all your ideas? Mm. Okay. I've got a few small ones. You've actually nicked one. My main one was was very much dating agency related as well, but I'll okay. get to it. It's a slightly different angle, but we'll get it's to weird, it. It's weird because that's not an obvious idea to go with. No, but I'll, I'll get to it. Um, so these are all very small, but I've well, got three small kind of is It kind of, I mean, it, there a is bit. a lot of dating elements in this one. Yeah. Anyway, I'll come back to that. Mm-hmm. My first idea was just based on my favorite supporting character, which is uh, the cabaret singer mm-hmm. played by Michael Jeter, yeah. sadly also passed away. Sure. I was thinking what could be, because again, his backstory moment when it, he, he mentions that all his friends have died and you get this glimpse of this like very dramatic, but very sad life that he's obviously led. Mm-hmm. And I thought that could definitely be its own thing. Mm. Like about like a cabaret singer in the seventies, eighties, you know, in New York, who's kind of, obsessed with old Hollywood and who's very flamboyant and very eccentric. Yeah. But then like the realities of like life in New York in the eighties hits and the AIDS crisis hits and all of his friends start dying. And, and this sounds very bleak, I know, but, <laughs> but I'm thinking like, it, it, I was thinking it could be like a Ryan Murphy kind of thing where it's like, it's gritty, but it's also very flamboyant and over the top. And, mm. and he's like the last survivor. And what I'm thinking is that, so he's this, he's maybe he like works at a drag bar or like a gay bar or something. He's, he's a, proper cabaret performer sure, yeah. he's obviously very good he's always got a good voice you know he's yeah. very talented but you know hard times hit and all of his friends start dying off and you know he, he hits the rock bottom he ends up you know the, the gay bar gets shut down maybe mm. and he ends up living on the streets and he's traumatized and he's you know he is that broken character that we see in the fisher king mm-hmm. but then maybe it's like a feel-good ish kind of story about how yes he loses his friends and family his chosen family in the gay scene but then actually while he's homeless, he kind of bonds with all the other homeless people and they kind of accept him as one of them and they're mm. not judgmental of him because they've yeah. all got their own reasons for being at the bottom of the barrel, yeah. you know, yeah. whatever reasons they are for being homeless. Like, they don't judge him. So he finds a new place that doesn't judge him. Mm. And maybe it's about how he, like, lives in this community and then eventually gets kind of taken under, under the wing of Robin Williams, who's this other kind of very flamboyant character. Mm-hmm. And maybe it, and maybe it follows on and follows him because he's kind of left in the original film. We don't get his... We don't get a sense that he actually finishes his story so maybe he also manages to find a way to put the pieces back together in some way sure yeah yeah maybe like robin williams and jeff bridges help him out and they put him on their reality show well i don't know if that's particularly helpful to someone's <laughs> mental health but uh <laughs> but maybe they sponsor him you know help him to get his life back together and you put him in charge of the choir or something yeah it's yeah, yeah, like yeah. The, as like the music conductor definitely and yeah it gives that, him like that, a, that really works yes yeah, so it, it gives him like a sense of self and he starts to put his life back together yeah yeah and it's like a full circle moment. He ends up, it gives him a happy ending as well. Mm-hmm. He ends up fulfilled and mentally healthy and well. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I just thought it'd be good to follow that character because there was, I had a lot of questions about that character and I thought it'd be good to, uh, <laughs> good to explore those a little bit. He's definitely the character that, that I'd want to explore the most. Definitely. From, yeah. from this film, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so my second idea was, again, something we were, something we've already discussed a little bit, mm-hmm. but cross it over with Hook. Because mm, I've really yeah. got into this idea of it being like the Lost Boys. Yeah. Because if you remember Hook, we've had requests to do Hook, but I've always wondered because it's it's iffy. It's if it's not a sequel, but I mean it's a sequel to Peter Pan. Yeah, it's like but a, it's not it's like, like it's like a spiritual sequel, but it doesn't have a specific. It's very much not a franchise. It's very much its own thing. Yeah, and there'd be a lot to talk about. I don't know how much you've seen it, but mm. like, I don't. Know, I, I I do it. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're on the Vita. I know you're quite a lot more strict than I am about like what the rules of our podcast are, but yeah, I'd, well. I'd cons- we're willing to consider it. Okay, well. Not like next week, but I'm just saying, I'm put it out there. Like we could do Hook, maybe. Sure. If you if you don't want sure. to, we don't have to. But. Okay. I'll let you. I'll let you think on that. Okay. Listeners, let us know if you really want us to do Hook. Put the pressure in. Yeah. Know. 
Anyway, so in the plot of Hook, obviously what happens is Peter Pan... Episode 200. Do Hook? Okay. Sure. I've been trying to think of, a, of an episode 200 film that we could do. I've had some thoughts, but Hook could definitely be in the mix. Okay, yeah. we'll throw it on we'll have, Yeah, let's, let's not like commit to that right away. We'll, yeah. have, we'll, we'll take it offline. We'll discuss. Yep, yep, but yep, maybe, yep. maybe. Anyway, so, but the plot of Hook obviously is that Peter Pan leaves Neverland as a child, mm -hmm. grows up to be a fairly mediocre adult, mm -hmm. and then obviously he goes back and rediscovers his childhood again. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. but I was thinking, what if actually th this is what, like a darker take on Hook, where Peter Pan leaves Neverland and mm -hmm. grows up, but instead of becoming like a manager in a insurance agency or whatever, like Robin Williams is, because in, in that film, Robin Williams' character is like a, a typical you know, businessman, isn't he? Mm -hmm. He's like, what if like actually Peter Pan really struggled to adapt to reality and getting older mm -hmm. and he actually ended up like burning out and the Lost Boys came with him and they all end up as these crazed, you know, homeless people mm. and they've got this weird society and that's why they've got this like connection in this society. Sure. They're all grown up children. They're all Lost Boys, literally Lost Boys. I'm really getting a childish vibe from them. That, yeah, I can totally see this. It's, yeah. I'm surprised that this isn't a Steven Spielberg film in many ways, but hmm. it, it does have that fairy tale ish vibe. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, that's all I've got. Just this idea of like, they are actually the Lost Boys, and then maybe, maybe some of them get to go back to Neverland. Maybe it just, cro I was thinking like it crosses over with Hook in some way. Like, mm, yeah. It's kind of all I've got, but I just, I just would like to explore that. The similarity is definitely there between those films. And, you know, with the, the Red Knight, all, that, that kind of all feels like stuff that would crop up in Peter Pan as well, you know? Yeah, no, I... Can't where's Peter, where's where's, where's Captain Hook in all this? Maybe Hook shows up. That's it. Maybe Hook also lands in New York. More importantly, where's and, Smee and at? Smee, of course. And you'd be a fan yeah. of Smee. Um, Everyone's favourite character. Sure, yeah. Why was he in the real world at the end of Hook? That didn't make any sense. Why? <laughs> <laughs> that question <laughs> plagued my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> well, what what would, if Captain Hook arrives in, like, the New York of the Fisher King? Mm. What do you think his character is? Is he another homeless person or is he? Oh, is he like a mean developer? There who it is. Who wants to there like, it is. Yeah, who wants to like take the homeless people, tear them out of the neighborhood yeah. and build a bunch of high rise flats instead. Yeah. And only Robin Williams sees him, sees through him as Captain Hawk. Everyone else is like, no, it's just some real, real estate developer. But he's like, no, he's it's Hook. Literally got a hook hand and everything. Yes, yeah, but only he just had diabetes. Yeah, just like, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. But then he eventually unmasks him and they have the fight. And Yeah. Yeah. And he, he vanquishes him. Pushes him into the river. A crocodile eats him because <laughs> there's crocodiles in New York now. Who knows? But yeah, yeah, and and that's how he and that's how Parry recovers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, I like that. Yeah, <laughs> so it's a bit out there, but I like <laughs> it's it. It's very silly. Yeah, but so is this film. So yeah, uh, yeah. And my final idea, which is kind of also what your idea was in a way, I was thinking. So it's 20 years later after the original film, or mm. 15, 16, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 2020. Anyway, point is. The video rental business that, oh, okay. uh, that lit the Anne and Here we go. Jack have been running. No, I'm not going to like go on and on about my childhood memories of video stores. But mm -hmm. what I'm saying is in 2020, that, that is a dead industry. Mm -hmm. That is not going to last. No. So I'm thinking that they obviously at some point in the intervening 20 years, they did branch out into DVDs. Mm -hmm. But even so, 2020, it's on its last legs. Yeah, They're yeah. the last surviving video rental store. Like Netflix has screwed them over massively. Mm -hmm. They are the last surviving independent video store in New York City, if uh, not possibly the world. Okay. <laughs> but they're, they're, cl they're clinging on. Not, e not even DVDs? No, 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 they do do DVDs. Okay. But the point is that even that, like this, the idea of a DVD rental store, yeah. it's really, you know, you'd have I, to struggle. I think video rental stores are going to make a comeback. How? Hipsters. Hipsters. Oh, it's like artisanal. Mm. You pay for the artwork. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe? We'll see. We'll see. I'm not, I'm not. Tapes are back. True, true. I don't think VHS has quite had the same revival yet. I don't. No, get I don't think it has yet. No, I don't. I don't get cassette tapes being back. No, me neither. It's. it's I get it's, vinyl. It's not the same as vinyl. Vinyl makes sense. It looks pretty on the wall. Yeah. The sounds, but cassettes were shit. Yeah. You can't even display cassettes. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Who's buying cassettes and why? It's. It's like the. It's the disadvantage of analog yes. with the disadvantage of digital. Yeah. <laughs> you know the sound isn't quite as like natural as vinyl. Mm -hmm. And also the tape gets ruined and you need to wind it back with a pencil and like it has a, it has a lifespan. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I truly don't understand it. There's, there's, there's literally no benefit. It's the, it's the worst of both worlds. Yeah. So, well, okay. So here we are. Unless mini disc makes a comeback. No, that never, that, I mean, that, 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 that never, never started. That, that never began. Yeah. 
<laughs> anyway. Okay, but I like this. So it's 2020. The video store is barely hanging on. Their only customers now are hipsters who yeah. only rent things ironically. Yeah. They don't even watch them. They just rent them ironically. So. <laughs> And Anne's at her wit's end. Mm-hmm. And she's like, this is not enough to sustain a lifestyle. You know, mm-hmm. they're behind on all their bills. So she's like, we need to we need to kick this out and start something new. Yeah. And so they're thinking of a new business that they can launch together. Mm-hmm. And I thought, similar to you, they could launch a dating agency. Because okay. they, yeah. they were very good matchmakers. Yeah, they did sure. a very good job of pushing Jack and Lydia together. I mean, he ended up in hospital, but sure. Yes, but I mean, uh, their, their meet cute worked. It's, yeah. it's, not, it's not Anne's fault that he got beaten up afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, so I'm thinking that they, Jack uses his, maybe Jack's back on the radio. So he uses his radio connections to reach out mm-hmm. to all these like lonely incel kind of guys. Mm-hmm. But instead of telling them to destroy humanity and mm-hmm. to, you know, feeding into their hatred and their self-loathing and all, that, all that st- and all that stuff. Instead, what he does is he, he reaches out to them and brings them in and encourages and tries to help them. To, with a dating agency it's, mm. a, it's a dating agency for misfits right okay yeah it's not a dating agency for like handsome successful people it's yeah. a dating agency for new york losers okay yeah for like homeless adult virgins and people like lydia who are just like strange mm. and, uh, and haven't really managed to find someone yeah so yeah and it's he him and Anne set up this whole thing where they kind of pair off people who are you know like, like the undateables you know mm. like a tv show that yeah. kind of thing like yeah. pair off people who are a struggle and they set up this whole business. I like that. I feel like that's a good character development for uh, for Jack. Yeah. And maybe, again, maybe like he's still got a cynical side and Anne has to keep pulling him back to actually yeah. helping people rather than just chasing the quick money. And mm-hmm. I was thinking, I've not really fleshed it out, but I was thinking maybe they come across somebody who is genuinely not seizable for anyone. who's like very angry, like a proper angry incel type. And Jack wants to try and just put him with anyone because he's got a lot of money. And, and Anne's like, no, he's he's not going to be good for anyone. Like, mm-hmm. I don't, I can't, I don't know what the main plot is, but I'm thinking there needs to be some stakes, obviously. Okay, okay. Um, let's just throw the Joker in this because that's just, well, there you go. That's, yeah. that's just screaming at me. Sure, yeah. Um, so is he trying to find a match for Joaquin Phoenix's Joker? That could work, yeah, because it's all, yeah, yeah, it could be like a fairy tale in New York where, yeah, all, yeah all because he's been trying to fix incels basically mm. trying to stop them from thinking that they own the world and that everybody's against them. Maybe this is a DC. A, a, like a subtle DC spin-off. Maybe it's got, he's, he's, he, he runs into the Joker, he runs into Venom. Mm-hmm. All these like unsuitable, like angry <laughs> solo males and he's got to find women who will be suitable for them. Yeah. But inadvertently, they set up a bunch of like evil power couples. Oh, nice, yeah. nice. Okay. So they do find a match for the Joker, but yeah. it's Harley Quinn. Exactly, yeah. They find, oh, the, I know a woman who's very disturbed who's yeah. just perfect for this guy. Yeah. But then they run rampant and it's, oh dear. <laughs> yeah, and they accidentally become like, the, a villainous dating agency. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> super villains. Yeah, super villain dating agency. Great, yeah. No, I like that. Mm. So that's <laughs> the Fisher King 2. Super villain dating agency. Great. <laughs> Didn't think that was where it was going to go, but I'll, no, I'll take but, it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's all mine. Have, you, have all yours done as well? Yeah, yeah. Should um, we move on to listener submissions? Sure, go for it. Have you got any this week? No. Okay. I only have a handful this week. Surprising. I thought I'd have more for this film. But it's not a very big film. It won Oscars. It, was, it made Is it money. a big film though? It's not huge, but... There we go. I've had more obscure films have more answers than this, but I don't know. Um, Travis Owen said, Two Fisher, Two King. It's the revenge of the Robin Williams dramas I've never seen. So all of the Robin Williams films. There's so many. All the dramas. So What? Two Fisher, Two King. That's yeah. just the standard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The re- revenge of the Robin Williams dramas that I've never seen. Like, all the Robin Williams films, there's so many that this person has not watched. Okay, sure. Get their revenge. I'm not saying it's great. I'm just yeah. saying it's something. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ryan Klemer said Fisher Price. <laughs> nice. It says crossover with Toy Story. Yeah. <laughs> Toy Story meets the Fisher King. <laughs> Mike Carey said The Fisher King of Queens. That's sitcom. Mm-hmm. Have you seen that sitcom? Sure, yeah. Kev- Kevin James, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've heard so, of it. Yeah, so sitcom crossover. I don't know. And finally, Finn Ross Russell, our Patreon friend, says a shot for shot remake set in the 12th century medieval Europe called Percival, <laughs> where it's actually, I guess, Parry actually in the fantasy land that he lives in in the original film. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So instead yeah. of being Parry, he's Percival. And he actually is fighting the Red Knight. Right. Okay. Maybe, it, maybe, like maybe fish- he has like uh, sort of visions of the real world. Like in this one, he has visions of. Like, yes. The- it's like, uh, has he taken the red tablet? It's like a matrix thing. Is he in yeah. the wrong reality? Yeah. And maybe it's like, and like he's basically been haunted by those two punks. Yes. Um, 
but what's the real reality? So yeah. it's like the Fisher King meets a Knight's Tale meets the Matrix. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. No, I like that. Yeah. That okay. works. Cool. That totally works. Great. Okay. So that's actually it for listener submissions. So thank you everybody for those sequel ideas. We ask for your listener submissions every week, a few days before we record, by putting posts out on Facebook and Twitter where you can post your ideas. So make sure you like and follow our pages if you don't miss out. To listen to more episodes of Beyond the Box Set, you can subscribe and browse our back catalogue on any podcasting platform, including iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and many others, all of which you can also leave a five-star review if you so wish. It really helps us out, so please do consider doing that. We're also available on Patreon, which is exclusively for the people who would rate us more than five stars if they could. You can find all of those links in the description below or at beyondtheboxset.com. Mm-hmm. And next week, mm-hmm. Harry, it's a you pick. Yeah. Are you prepared? Yeah. And what have you got for me? Please um, not another absolutely anything. No. No, no, very, very much not. Good. Um, I have, just because this was on my shortlist to do anyway, I've basically decided that, yes, we are going to do a Robin Williams season. Okay. I'm just going to spin it out a little bit more. Okay, so um, it's November of Robin Williams, sure. I guess. Didn't, didn't mean to do a season in November, but we've done two in a row and I'm about to pick a third. Sure, okay. So, basically. Obviously, I didn't enjoy absolutely anything. No. Because that was one of the worst films we've done. I'm glad you agree. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For many reasons. Yeah. If you didn't get it, I didn't really enjoy this film particularly. No, I got that too, yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm trying to find one that's really going to, like, this is the best of Robin Williams. Okay. So this is the film that he won an Oscar for. Okay. So we're going to do Good Will Hunting. Okay. Definitely been on the shortlist for a while. So. Yeah. Cool. Okay. I'm, I'm here for that. I'm, in, I'm interested to see how well it's written as well, because obviously this is the one that uh, Matt Damon and Ben, ben Affleck, Affleck won, their, won, their, won their first Oscar with. So, Indeed. Um, have you seen it before? I have a long time ago, so I don't really remember it. Okay. Matt Damon's smart, I think. Yeah, Matt Damon's <laughs> smart, yes. The movie? Essentially, yes. <laughs> but I've not seen it in a while as well. I'm looking forward to revisiting. Yeah, cool. so that's going to be good. good. Yeah, I'm excited to revisit that film. It's been a while. Yeah. Great. Okay, so listeners, join us next week for Good Will Hunting. Yeah. See you See next you week, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.